excited to, to welcome to you to today's webinar on sustainable dairy production. Uh, as you said, Charles and Eric, uh, methane emissions and feed additives are super important for sustainable dairy production. Um, just recently, one of our panelists, uh, Peter Lund, hit national news in Denmark with the story of the great potential of feed additives to ensure a sustainable dairy production. And Denmark is honored to have California as a close partner. We all need to change make great efforts and show determination to ensure food supply and combat climate change in the coming decades. Uh, we see California's farmers, knowledge institutions and authorities as our close friends and allies on this journey. And, uh, and of course, hope, uh, which this also is a great example of, that you'll see Denmark as your friend and ally uh, on this, this journey together. Um, I would like to thank you all, uh, our panelists and moderator for agreeing to uh, participate. And um, uh, without further ado, time has, has, has run a bit already. I, I, I'll, I'll just say that, that we look very much forward to spend the coming hour in your company and hear your thoughts on the future for sustainable dairy production. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brooke and Minister Schwartz. Very much appreciate your opening comments today. I'm Michael Bocadoro, Executive Director of Dairy Cares here in California. For those of you not familiar with our organization, Dairy Cares was created 20 years ago to provide the California dairy industry with a forum to discuss uh, sustainability issues and to pursue opportunities for climate smart and planet smart dairy practices here in California. Turning to climate, California has been at the forefront of efforts to reduce methane, almost entirely through the use of methane, um, manure methane capture and avoidance projects. And those efforts have been truly remarkable and highly successful. But as both Dr. Brooke and Minister Schwartz already stated, if California and the rest of the world are to achieve broader methane reductions, we will need uh, to reduce and focus on enteric emissions. Uh, that's critical here in California, and it's even more critical in the rest of the world. So with those opening comments, I'm going to turn to our experts, our panelists today, and I'm going to start with Professor Lund, and I'm asking each of the panelists to provide some brief comments on the state of where we are with enteric uh, emission reductions and feed additives, uh, and then we'll move into some questions for the entire panel. Professor Lund. Yeah, thank you. And I will try to see if I can share my screen here. Uh, yeah, do you see some PowerPoints? Yeah, we do. Yes, yeah. Peter. Okay, good. So, so what I would like to just address very briefly is uh, sometimes I think we have, let me just see if this works. Sometimes I think we, we might have what I call, we develop a tunnel vision. We have a lot of focus on finding these feed additives that reduce methane. And there seems to be a competition on who can find the additive that reduces the most. But I think we sometimes to forget, try to, we, we, we tend to forget about the trade-offs. And one of the things I especially have in mind is this feeding behavior, animal welfare. I think that's an underestimated research area when we talk about feed additives and very especially the very potent feed additives. Let me just give you a short example. Let's say we have a new feed additive coming up, a feed additive that reduces methane by 40%, but 2% of the cows get sick, they get a mild acidosis, and 0.1% of the cows actually die from using this feed additive. And we see an increased content of an unwanted compound, compound in the milk by 70% of the maximum recommended level. So the question would be, can you accept this as a farmer, as a stakeholder, as a consumer, as a politician? And what should those numbers actually be before you can accept the feed additive? Some would probably claim that none of the cows would get sick and none of the cows would die in order for this feed additive to be used. But then I'll just remind you on how we feed our cows today. We feed our cows with lots of concentrate, slaughter calves and dairy cows. And we know that some of the cows get sick from this feeding strategy. So this is something I think we need to, to, to think about. Is it a totally no-go to have cows getting sick or die from using these feed additives? Or can we accept 
some kind of, uh, of issues with animal health and animal welfare. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lund. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Sander von Zerveld uh, to offer his opening comments. Thank you. I'll quickly attempt to share my screen. No. Let me know if this works. We can see that. Very good. Thank you. So I, I will share some about um, uh, Cargill's activities in, uh, in methane reduction. My name is uh, Sander van Zijdeveld. I am uh, leading um, the marketing and technology team for ruminants in West Europe for Cargill, but I have a background in uh, methane research. Uh, our company is quite, quite involved in reducing uh, methane emissions, uh, first of all through diet optimization uh, that we have been doing for decades, uh, basically diluting the CO2 per kilogram of milk. But more and more, we are using our diet formulation also to do a more targeted intervention and lowering absolute methane levels directly by increasing feed intake or, um, for instance, including feed additives or increasing the fat level. Uh, today, we are involved in, in the go-to market of our first methane reducing feed material. So it's different than a feed additive. And we are gaining a lot of experience in how to bring those to market in, uh, in EU countries. At the same time, we are still involved in the development of new feed additives and technologies, um, exploring new additives with our suppliers, but also our own feed, feed additive companies. And we are even exploring some, some non-feed ways of reducing methane emissions at, um, at the same time, like uh, ZELP, a technology that is uh, near market as well. Uh, when we look at um, methane reduction, uh, we definitely see some positive evolutions in the market as well as some, some barriers that we still run into. On the positive sides, and I'm, I'm mainly taking the European perspective here, we see governments, dairy processors, supermarkets uh, across Europe starting incentive programs to reduce CO2 emissions and, and even more specifically uh, methane emissions. And what we start to see to increase as well is the scientific rigor by which uh, new feed additives and materials are evaluated for their merit in reducing methane reduction, where we come from a relatively unmature market in claims. We move to a much more mature market in making claims and having those assessed, unfortunately, still country by country. So it's still a long process uh, for us. Uh, so on the, on the barrier side, we see that the acknowledgement of methane reduction tools is still done on a, na a national level. So country by country, we have to do the evaluation. On the specific additive sides, we see, as in the US, a very long lead time for additives to come onto the market, so very high regulatory pressure. And while we see incentives coming in Europe, they are often not uh, high enough to cover the additional cost of the, of the additive for the farmer. And uh, as a company, we believe that um, the check for this should not land on the farmer's plate, right? So that, that's where we have to, to work. Uh, another thing that we see emerging is that uh, commercial strategies, so um, uh, technologies owned by companies may be favored over more generic strategies like um, adding fat to the diet. Because generally, uh, it's up to companies to invest in the technologies and don't demonstrate that they are effective, which I think could create a bias uh, towards more commercial strategies than uh, the more generic ones. That, that's all I wanted to share for, uh, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Zander. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Dr. Amias Cabre from here at UC Davis in California. Dr. Cabre. All right, so hopefully you can, you can see my slide. All right, so uh, just a couple of slides to uh, uh, give a, an outline. Um, uh, just to add to what uh, Peter was saying earlier, you know, we do have quite a lot of different uh, strategies uh, when it comes to uh, uh, methane mitigation. Um, so the feed additives would be one of the, the, that aspect, and, but we have a, a number of different tools. But over the years, uh, we've seen that the other techniques, uh, we will get maybe 10, 15% uh, if you're lucky in terms of reductions, but with the feed additives we've had, um, 
uh, quite uh, impressive results so far. And uh, here's kind of a, a summary of um, what is out there, uh, what has been happening so, so far in, in terms of the, the effectiveness. Uh, but the effectiveness here doesn't really tell the whole story. Uh, again, as, as Peter alluded to, that there are some trade-offs that, that, that may happen as well. Um, but we do have a, a number of tools that we need to be, um, uh, we, we need to do a, a lot more research to, to make sure that what we see in terms of effectiveness is uh, exactly what's happening within with the methane reduction, uh, particularly looking into the issues of uh, how does it be affected by uh, types of uh, different type of diets and under what conditions that it will work. So there's a need to do work both uh, under control conditions to figure out what is happening to, to, to begin with, and at the same time, uh, looking into the applicability in the commercial farm as well. Uh, so one of the issues we've had uh, in a number of those uh, feed additives has been um, not enough um, uh, testing that has been done. So not enough statistical power to actually say that you know, uh, this, this, this kind of uh, intervention is effective at, at this level, right? So um, we are working with uh, CDFA at the moment to try to come up with some standards to, 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 to when you're testing feed additives, depending on the level of reduction that you're expecting, you really need to have enough power to be able to say, you know, this is, this is what's happening. So a lot of the work that has been done so far, unfortunately, has not followed that kind of standard where we don't have enough power to be able to say uh, the, the effectiveness of uh, feed additives. But uh, obviously, I think this is something that really needs to be done. I, I, uh, liked, uh, I, I like seeing CDFA putting a, a lot of effort in, into this and uh, our partnership with, uh, with, with Denmark and, and, and other countries. And, and now um, I saw a comment from uh, Hayden on the Global uh, Methane Hub as well, um, you know, with a lot of investment in this, in this area. So I think this is the time to really to, um, uh, to have a coordinated global effort to make sure that uh, we have feed additives that are ready to be used in, in the next few years. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cabret, for those opening remarks. Uh, finally, for our panelists, we're gonna turn to Christine Brockner with Orla Foods. Christine? Thank you. And I'm just gonna jump straight into short introduction to, to Orla. Uh, so, us uh, representing the uh, the farmers and the end user of these uh, feed additive products. Uh, Arla is uh, a cooperative we own by nearly 10,000 farms uh, across seven countries in northern part of Europe. Uh, we have five uh, global brands, so Arla, Starbucks, Puck, Castello and Norpark, uh, uh, sold across the globe. Uh, but jumping into the topic of today, so for the past nearly 10 years uh, or so, Arla has developed a climate tech model and implemented that model on nearly all our farms as of today. Uh, and uh, for that model, we collect a lot of data and information from the individual farms, and we use that to calculate the, uh, the footprint from the individual farms. Uh, and we are therefore also able to monitor the carbon footprint year on year and how we develop. Uh, and so average today in Arla is 1.15 kilo uh, CO2 equivalent per kilo milk uh, and slowly decreasing. Uh, but uh, more important is that from the model, we are also able to monitor and, and, and learn where we have our emission. And, uh, uh, the single one biggest uh, emission factor is uh, enteric methane production from the cows. And uh, because of the information we get from our model, we're also able to start acting. And uh, that's what we're doing right now. So the, uh, the, the pilot work that was mentioned earlier uh, today is, is uh, done by ALA. So we're testing feed additives on uh, 30, uh, different farms across all countries to learn what's happening, what are the practical implications, uh, where do we need to improve, where do we see challenges with these feed additives. Um, and, and we do that to, uh, of course, eventually have a good, a solid solution that we can implement in our tool. 
uh, and start monitoring the uh, methane emission from the from the farms going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, next, we're going to move into our panel discussion with all four of the panelists. I want to thank each of them for providing their their opening comments that have helped set the stage for today's discussion. I have a number of questions, and I'd like each of, of you to address them. And uh, the, uh, we'll go ahead and start um, with uh, uh, Professor Lund first. Uh, and the question I'd like you to all ponder is that there are a considerable number of claims being made about products and specifically methane reduction capabilities. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, where we are with respect to evaluating methane reduction claims of different feed additives. And also, what are some of the key considerations for evaluating feed additives beyond their methane reduction capabilities? So Dr. Lund, let me turn it over to you first. Yeah, um, so the first thing that comes in mind is that if you look into the, for example, the EU guidelines, we have this kind of weird separation between feed additives and a feed material. So for a feed additive, you need to have, how, how can you say, an, an EU approval to claim an effect on methane, but you don't do so on a feed material. That's the first thing that is kind of strange. And the second thing is these, these uh, claims, they only... methane can be reduced. And therefore, in my book, they're not really worth anything because you cannot say that, okay, I have an EU propo proposal or an EQ EU approval saying that I can claim a 30% reduction on, on my feed additive. And I think it would be much better if we could have some kind of yeah, numbers on the actual reduction potential. So I think the first step would say, okay, if you want an EFSA approval in, in, in Europe, that should be accompanied by also that EFSA provides an estimate on the reduction potential of that given feed additive. And then we have this weird yeah, distribution between feed additives and feed material, which I have never understood, and also poses some problems in, in, in when people put forward claims that you can basically put forward a claim basically on anything for a feed material, but the rules are not the same for, for a feed additive. That's one of some of the things that I see as as really as a barrier now for 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 being able to compare feed additives, because we have a lot of feed additives approaching universities or dairies or whatever, coming with a certificate from some kind of weird organization. And to me, they're not really trustworthy in any way, uh, because these organizations also make money on providing these uh, certificates. So it has to be some kind of yeah, in a European perspective, EU approval that is uh, that we need. Thank you, uh, Sander. Your thoughts on questions that have been posed? Yeah, yeah. So the the um, landscape of making claims have have changed quite a bit since since I started working in this area. So there used to be quite a lot of claims uh, just made without any substantiation, but we see. A significant maturing in the EU market where countries, it's still uh, approved on the country base, start uh, a committee of renowned scientists in their country that really vet the scientific merit of solutions. So we start to see that uh, claims cannot no longer be just made as is or paid by a commercial organization. But there is some, some more rigorous scientific screening of, of claims before they are admitted to the system. The downside is that it's still done on a national level, so we see different strategies being allowed in, in different countries, and I think we could benefit from more alignment on how we appropriate claims to feed materials and feed additives, where I agree fully with uh, Professor Lund that it's more a more clear situation for feed additives today than feed materials. But I see the perspective and, and a growing awareness that we need to validate claims before we allow them to enter carbon trading systems. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Cabrave, your thoughts on emission reduction claims? Yeah, so I think uh, before 2021, it was probably a little bit um, loose in terms of uh, there's no hard and fast kind of rules of uh, how we can show the evidence. But I think since then, 
uh, there has been development of uh, protocols that uh, that puts things into perspective and um, for claims to be made, you know, those protocols need to be followed. Um, so the, the, the protocol from, from VIRA right now uh, on the books uh, that was published about a year ago or so, and there's uh, now uh, I see a, a new protocol from Gold Standard that's just been uh, published or at least is on public review as well. So um, we, we're going to need those kind of um, um, global protocols to make sure that those claims are, are accurate. Um, sometimes you, you, you can have just one, one uh, study and then uh, the claims out there. Sometimes it's just even in vitro. So I think those kind of protocols really help to rein in uh, what people can claim in and, and you know, how we can, we can make claims on, uh, on reduction. Thank you, Dr. Cabrave. And Christine, we're going to turn to you last on this initial question. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with Peter that we, we definitely need to have some more alignment across, across borders and uh, countries um, uh, for, for these products. Uh, but I'd also like to, to mention that uh, the EFSA approval is important to us, uh, not only because of the methane reduction claim, but also due to the safety and the safety uh, to to our products uh, so that we don't see anything passed on to the milk. Uh, and, and, and that's why we look to the EFSA approval, of course, uh, uh, as important. Great. And then just a follow up uh, as we're still in this initial question, and I don't know if any of you would like to to jump in on this, but are we forgetting about pollution swapping, something that may reduce methane, but may lead to an increase um, in another uh, air quality emission or water quality impact? What are your thoughts on pollution swapping concerns? If I, if I may uh, uh, respond to that, um, I think every time we had, there's, a, there's a claim that has to be a, a life cycle assessment conducted because uh, like you said, there is a potential for pollution swapping. There's uh, unintended consequences and and all that. So I think it needs to be framed within a, a life cycle assessment uh, way. Uh, luckily, we do have guidelines. The the FAO has come up with guidelines on how to do this, particularly for feed additives. Uh, so we need to look into the what's the effect of uh, producing the feed additive itself, because there's going to be some uh, emissions associated with the, with the production of feed additives as well. And then once you use those feed additives, also what are the impacts into the whole system as well? So lo looking at uh, if it is in, in dairy systems, for example, you have to look at you know, uh, from the feed material, do you need to change the feed material? If it's, if it's not, then uh, what about uh, how, what, what's happening with the manure? Is there changes in, in the manure, you know, uh, nutrient composition of the manure? Um, or if there are some uh, other inorganic compounds that are coming out that are maybe uh, have issue on uh, on the uh, on the environment, or what about the, um, the the performance of the of the animals themselves? So there's a number of issues that need to be considered. So an LCA is really really highly recommended to be able to say this is the net reduction that you can get by using certain specific additives. Thank you, Dr. Cabrave. Dr. Lund, anything you'd like to add on that topic or we can move yeah, to the I next fully, question? Yeah, I, I fully agree. And it, I think it's very important that this life cycle analysis is done as broadly as possible in any way, so that we not only include, as we normally do in a life cycle analysis, the cost of producing the feed from a climate perspective, but also these all these add-ons that uh, Hermias mentioned before. And I would still really like to raise the flag for these animal health and welfare issues, which at least from a Danish perspective are extremely important. That most consumers from, from a Danish perspective would say that any impact on animal health and welfare is a no-go, no matter how efficient any feed uh, additive would be to, uh, to reduce methane. Thank you very much. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump into um, our second question, and that second question that I'm going to pose again to all of you is, what are the major barriers for researching feed additives that reduce enteric methane uh, emissions? And uh, Sander, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that question. Um, I think financially, there are not so many barriers today. So we see a lot of uh, investment in this space, both from a governmental level as well as, as companies investing in this space. 
I think the, the major barrier that the major practical barrier that we run into when trying to test new technologies is the capability of institutes to really measure methane emissions where yeah. the limiting factor have been respiration chambers for a long time uh, we see more capacity being built on that green feeds are providing some capacity but as we need to test new technologies new feed additives in quite a large range of situations i think the major barrier we run into is the practical availability of green feeds and respiration chambers to actually measure the effect that's, that's the main hurdle we uh, we see today dr cabre would love to get your thoughts on barriers yeah i think uh, the, the the biggest one that for me is uh, uh, capacity uh, as as just uh, was mentioned uh, you know this uh, this i think right now is uh, quite difficult to to do a lot of those studies right away, um, right here, I can give you an example. Uh, UC Davis, uh, we have probably six or seven feed additives that we can do right now, but we, we can't because there's no there's not enough capacity to, to to do that. So, I think the capacity to do this this type of research is um, is I think the uh, the barrier at the moment. If you're just looking at it from the research perspective. Uh, but I think things are getting better. I think uh, uh, more and more um, uh, universities and other institutions are uh, getting equipped with this. Uh, I know uh, uh, people like the CLOC have been uh, completely inundated with requests for, for green fields. Now, if you if you want now, you probably have to wait <laughs> six months to a year to do that. So I, again, that's another barrier because, you know, if you want to buy green feed right now, you know, you have to wait months and months and months to, to, to be able to, to get that. So that's another barrier for, for research. You, you're not going to be able to go, get away and, and uh, start the, the research right away. Uh, so I think, like Sander said, the, the financial constraints are becoming less and less. And, you know, with uh, institutions like um, CDFA providing uh, funds and, and other institutions. For, so I think the funding situation gets better and, and also uh, startup companies and investments. I think we, we do have that. But the issue we have right now is the capacity. Thank you, Dr. Cabre. Christine, thoughts? Yeah, I'm just going to echo the, uh, the discussion already on capacity. So, um, yeah, uh, we have sophisticated equipment. We have the respiratory chambers used, uh, but we just need more of them uh, so that we can test uh, these uh, feed additives simultaneously. Uh, it takes a long time to run a research project on the large movement and animals. Uh, and um, and we know it's uh, diet dependent as well. So we need to, to have multiple studies going on simultaneously. And that would just requires uh, skilled personnel. And finally, Dr. Lund, your thoughts on the topic. Yeah, I, I fully agree on the capacity, but I think it's, it's not only about uh, respiration chambers and green feed units. I think it's more about manpower. I think if you have a PhD uh, working with enteric methane, you can get a job all over the world and we are stealing postdocs from each other. Uh, and that's not a very beneficial way. So, so, so manpower is to me, number one. And then I think what we're lacking now is this basic understanding of room and function. It's not been a research area that has been prioritized for years. Uh, so we are a little bit lacking behind there. So it's not that much about which microbes are present in the rumen. That's okay, that's an interesting study, but it's more about what do they actually do? And what do they do when you give a feed additive? And what happens with all that carbon and hydrogen that is not erupted as methane? Is that actually something that the animal can use? So, so a better understanding of the symbiosis between cow, microbes and methanogens, I think that's to me one of the barriers right now for us to move forward and identify this feed additive of the future, with which has a really, really high methane reduction potential. Because we don't want to jeopardize the symbiosis in the rumen. Thank you all for your comments. Um, let's jump into the next question, but I'm going to reserve the right to um, come back to, to this question and ask a couple of follow-ups. But let's make sure we get through the agenda and move to the third question. And that is when and if products with methane reduction claims are approved for use. We are seeing some products approved in Europe and South America. Question is, what role should major food companies and governments play in promoting the adoption of these additives? 
And we're going to start with Dr. Cabrave on this one. Uh, well, um, I think, you know, um, it's, it's obvious that we need to reduce um, methane emissions um, to assess it substantially uh, to meet a lot of the, the, the claims. So in terms of industry, if you look at the dairy industry in, in the U.S., that there, there is a, um, a, go, a stated goal of reducing by uh, by uh, uh, to, to get to net zero by 2050, and, and on the beef side, it's about uh, by 2040. Um, so, yeah, without having this concerted effort from industry and from government, I think it was going to be very difficult to to, to get there. Um, so, I think the the, the role of, of governments, um, as it as it's starting to happen in, in Europe, for example, we are incentivizing um, farmers to actually use those uh, the, the feed additives and making sure that, you know, uh, I think incentives from governments would really help in the adoption of those uh, feed additives, because there's obviously going to be a cost to, to the feed additive. So um, the, somehow that cost has to be um, to taken care of. And some you know, it could be part of it would be incentives and part of it would be um, through um, carbon credits. And this is where uh, industry, uh, food industry uh, that are using dairy products and, and animal source foods, they really would help there as well, you know, making sure that those credits are absorbed within the, uh, the, the industry. So uh, having a sort of an insetting mindset where um, producers as well as uh, suppliers are working together to, to make sure that it is uh, reduction. So whether it's be providing the feed additives and taking the claims or uh, getting incentives from gov governments, I think those kind of incentives are needed in order to, to, to widespread use of those feed additives. Thank you, Dr. Cabre. Christine? Yeah, I, I just uh, want to mention here that, that Ale has already launched an incentive model to incentivize our farmers um, to, with the purpose of um, implementing different uh, climate-friendly levers um, so that we support uh, our farms uh, in this journey towards our end goal. Uh, uh, yeah, so. We already have a system implemented. And then, and the intention is to slowly, one by one, implement more levers uh, as uh, as they are ready for implementation. Can you talk a little bit more about the incentives that Arla is offering to your producers and what form those incentives take? Uh, so the model uh, right now is is uh, based on the, it's a point system. Uh, and so we have already approved uh, uh, technologies and levers that is uh, implemented. It's it's not um, it's just starting up. Uh, it was uh, launched uh, uh, not so long ago, uh, and it, it's a combination of both uh, implementing technology, but it's also a uh, a uh, a system where we intensify uh, the production improvement on the farm. So. Uh, uh, efficiency and efficiency on the farms, uh, also taking in other aspects such as animal welfare, uh, feed efficiency. Uh, yeah, uh, so we're working on multiple levels on farm level to uh, to bring down the uh, emission. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And Dr. Lund, thoughts? Yeah, I can say my main concern is is the risk for, for leakage. So if you introduce some kind of, let's call it a tax on carbon dioxide in one country, what happens then with, with the cows in, in that country? Do they, do, will they still be there or will they leave for, for another country? If all countries have some kind of tax, they will most likely not leave for another country. But until that is the case, I see a huge risk that animal production moves and it might move from those countries where the carbon footprint is actually lowest to, country, to countries where the carbon footprint is highest. And in that way, we can maybe say that we have fulfilled the, the requirements for Denmark or for California, but I don't think the globe cares whether a cow is located in Denmark or California or somewhere else. That's, that's my main concern. And nobody really knows le these uh, leakage rate, rates when you introduce these uh, carbon dioxide taxes. 
Well, you've just uh, put yourself on my favorite list. Uh, leakage is a, a topic that I love to talk about here in California. It's one of the issues, in fact, that even our goals recognize that leakage would be a problem. So I very much appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, that's not just an issue across countries, it's an issue across the United States. California has been very successful with a, a voluntary incentive-based approach to these reductions, um, but avoiding regulation or avoiding taxes, which would lead to leakage, I couldn't agree more, is a critical issue. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, but before we leave this question, I want to give uh, Sander a chance to chime in. Thank you, Michael. Yes. What we unfortunately see is that new strategies that are being approved still lead to uh, added dietary costs that would land on the farmer's plate if, if not incentivized by the industry. That's why we start to see uh, the European industry taking its role. So there's Arla uh, subsidizing, Frisson Campina started an incentive program. The Belgian government is paying for methane reduction. So we start to see that coming. The, the level of, of, of compensation is not enough yet to Am I still there? Yeah. Uh, to, to convince uh, to convince the farms to, uh, to to use them, um, but there's another role for uh, for industry and governments as well, and that's in creating the awareness among the farmer base. So what we see when trying to roll out such strategies is that we need to create a lot of awareness that this is an important topic for uh, for the consumers and for the dairy processors. Uh, among the farmer base, that's another important task for uh, for industry to perform. Thank you. Um, we've got a few minutes. We've got ourselves back on track, and we've got a few minutes more. So the scary part now is I get to ad lib a little bit with some questions and and try and see if we can drill down a little bit deeper in some of the topics that have been discussed today. And um, I believe Dr. Lund, you're the one that brought this up, but let me pose a question. Let's talk about it a little bit more. We've talked about incentives. We've talked about cost of farmers. And I think the importance, uh, if we're expecting farmers to feed these additives once they do become available, uh, the cost of those additives is going to um, have to be at a minimum covered uh, to help provide incentives. We've seen how incentives have worked here in California tremendously in the manure methane side. And we're very interested in your thoughts on how uh, incentives and covering the cost of farmers is going to be important as we continue this discussion. We'll start with Dr. Lund and then I'll, I'll move to the others. Yeah. Um, my first take on that would be that you said that any costs should be fully compensated. And, and maybe I don't agree because in some way we have this tradition that the polluter pays. So who is the polluter here? In some way that's, that's the dairy production but maybe they cannot pay the full bill. So we need to help them in some way. But I'm not fully sure that I agree that it should be, how can you say, cost neutral for a farmer because it has a given carbon footprint. We have to realize we have a challenge in, in our meat and, and dairy production. And that in some way, I think is also fair that the farmers pay. You can then say, how does, who should then pay afterwards? Can the farmer send the bill on to the dairy and can the dairy then send the bill to the consumer? I don't think, I don't think that we in the future will see two different types of milk in the, in the, in the supermarket, a low carbon footprint milk and, and a normal milk. I think it's gonna be mandatory that everybody reduces their carbon footprint. Otherwise you will not be in the market in the future. Dr. Cabre, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, I, I, I believe that you know the, it needs to be um, uh, a, a lot easier for for farmers to to to, to incorporate the, the you know, technologies like like feed additives to to make sure that uh, it's not an added cost and that you know that cost is not going to be uh, already uh, farmers are you know, operating on on small margins so. Uh, expecting farmers to uh, to absorb all the costs, I, I don't think it's going to be reasonable. Uh, but the, but there there are different ways of, of doing that. I think one is the directly doing incentives through uh, government programs and all that. I don't think uh, all uh, all countries will do the same kind of thing. 
But I think the, 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 the second one that I think will have a, a better chance um, is the, the is carbon market. I think the, the carbon market would have a much easier time in terms of uh, providing value. And, and that value would be shared by the whole population, not just by, by, by farmers, right? So it would be a responsibility of, uh, of everyone to, 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 to reduce the, the, those emissions. And, and if you have a, a carbon market and a reasonable uh, price for, for carbon as well, it's not, it's not just having a carbon market. If, it is, if it's gonna be below what the farmers is gonna cost them to do it, then it's not gonna work. So a reasonable uh, carbon market, I think will help um, make it a lot easier for, for farmers to participate and, and also for the whole industry to reduce its emissions. Because what we have seen is that you know, this agriculture has always been, particularly livestock production has always been a target for, you know, this is high emissions happening here and there. So if or the, the whole industry itself, the livestock industry has in, in, in together, be able to work and, and have all those carbon reducing and having in setting up to within this, the industry, I think that's the, that's the way forward. And so incentives, yes, but I think more the, the carbon markets, I think will play a, a bigger role. Sorry, I lost the sound for a minute. <laughs> um, we, we, have, we have done uh, some research among farmers as well about the willingness to, uh, to invest in methane reduction technology when it's available. And there we see that about 2% of idealist farmers will adopt uh, methane reduction technologies at a loss. So it will be a real minority if we don't start uh, compensating the farmers for, uh, for the use of these additives. Whereas 50, 60% is willing to invest to, to, to use them at break even. And the remainder would even uh, only consider using them when they make money on them. So that's a very important consideration when uh, considering incentives, we will have to give them to, uh, to lead to large scale adoption. In the end, I think when we uh, move to a, a large scale situation where methane reduction technology is adopted, I think it has to be reflected in the consumer price of dairy, uh, that we have emissions associ associated with the production, right? And, and that, that is true for more products that we would need to create, um, uh, maybe not a voluntary consumer exception where we have two lines of product, one with low carbon footprint, one with high, but make it a standard that we need to reduce methane production, have that reflected in the price towards the, the consumer. Thank you. Uh, Christine. Thoughts on this topic? Can I ask you just re to repeat the question because I lost sound too. Um. Certainly, and apologies. Um, just your thoughts on the importance of incentives as we um, uh, expect farmers to begin implementing feed additives once they become commercially available. Well, since we already have implemented an incentive model, it's 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 clear we see that as a need. Um, uh, but I'd just like to to say to this um, uh, topic that uh, since we are already out there testing feed additives with farms, uh, we see the farmers are are very dedicated. Uh, uh, not 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 that that we see a specific um, dedication to a specific product, but but to the cost. Uh, so they are highly dedicated to contributing and being part of uh, of driving this solution, uh, and um, yeah, uh, and, and I think that it's very important that 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 we have this um, uh, commitment from our farmers to to work, uh, and that is not only on feed additives; it's all the technology, it's 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 all the improvements on the farms that they can do. Uh, they're highly committed. Uh, to this journey. Thank you. You know, I think we can say the same for dairy farmers here in California. They've been very committed to, you know, working with the state, uh, with the California Department of Food and Agriculture and our California Air Resources Board uh, to uh, work cooperatively, um, you know, private public partnerships uh, with incentives uh, to uh, achieve the reductions. And, you know, here in California, the 
dairy methane reduction programs being implemented by CDFA are among the not just most cost effective, um, reducing carbon for about $9 per ton, uh, which is very cost competitive anywhere in the world. Uh, but equally important, it's also California's uh, most successful program in terms of total carbon reduction to date. And so we have a tremendous story. And um, I want to thank each of the panelists for your comments today. We've hit that uh, time where I need to uh, conclude the discussion. And I'm just going to see if I can recap uh, and make sure I, I cover some of the issues I think I heard today. Uh, as we continue down this um, path to finding solutions on the enteric uh, emissions associated with livestock across the world. Um, I think we all agree that enteric emission reductions are critical. There's no way to achieve California's goals or world goals or the goals of other countries without finding effective enteric emission reduction solutions. Uh, clearly, a lot more research needs to be done on that front. It sounds like not just understanding the feed additives themselves, but also a better understanding of how those feed additives interact within the rumen of the cow. Um, we heard a little bit today about the importance of understanding trade-offs, and that's why a life cycle analysis of all these products will be critically important as we move forward. I think Dr. Cabre made that point very effectively and others agreed. Um, I think one other area where there was consensus was just the importance of alignment across borders and countries um, in terms of approval of feed additives and in terms of how we are approaching uh, the use of those additives. I think it was Dr. Lund who brought up the concern about leakage. It's a concern that we certainly recognize here in California and share. Uh, if California was to have regulations that were different than the rest of the United States, um, we would simply see dairy production shifting from California uh, to those other states that are less stringent. And the end result is higher methane emissions uh, for um, the global atmosphere. And that's not a solution, frankly, that in my mind is, um, is failure. So we really need to make sure that we are having alignment across borders and countries. Um, I heard a lot of consensus around the importance of incentives, um, both government incentives, but also um, incentives from uh, the food supply chain. And I think it was Dr. Cabre who mentioned insetting um, of emissions um, and how critical that is. And I think it should be clear to all of us that a number of global food companies um, have made significant pledges to reduce their uh, supply chain carbon emissions by 50% or more by 2030. And I think most of us recognize that that can only be achieved if uh, the dairy ingredients that those global food companies are using uh, is reduced. Uh, the uh, cradle to farm gate uh, can be 70 to 80% of the uh, emissions of one of these uh, dairy products from one of these global food companies. So there's no way to achieve a 50% reduction in their footprint unless we're achieving those reductions on our farms. And I've, I've been very pleasantly surprised uh, to see the full engagement of many of those global food companies in the desire to work with their suppliers, with the farmers uh, that supply them uh, to help um, bring some of these solutions, some of these planet smart and climate smart solutions to the forefront and help them get implemented, including stepping up uh, with financial incentives to help offset the cost. And um, finally, you know, um, I, I, I heard a lot about um, the cost of farmers and the concern about leakage. And I think those two issues are very much uh, intertwined, not just here in California, but across the world. Um, you know, if farmers in one country are expected to do something different, uh, that's simply going to lead to leakage. And so we need to continue to move down this voluntary incentive-based approach that California has been implementing very successfully. Uh, the U.S., uh, the United States Department of Food and Agriculture is following uh, and working closely with California in leadership to provide significant incentives across the U.S. and maintaining a voluntary incentive-based approach. And what I heard today suggests to me that you know, the, a similar approach is being considered around the world. And I think that's critically important. Um, I tried to capture 
um, much of the discussion today. Um, we've got a minute or two since we started a minute or two late. If any of the panelists would like to chime in with anything that I might have missed that they think is important as we move forward collectively. Um, I'll give you each you know, 30 seconds if you want to chime in. Dr. Cabre. I think I think I think you summarized quite so quite well. Um, so I, I'm I'm just very um, very enthusiastic in, in seeing uh, that the, the way things are going to go in the future. I think uh, a lot of things, a lot of the barriers have been removed. There's still some barriers uh, are there, but a lot of barriers have been removed. So um, I'm just expecting a lot more activity in this area in the next few years. Thank you, Dr. Lund. Your quick closing <laughs> comments. Yeah, maybe to say we've talked a lot about feed additives today in dairy production, but we should not forget that a high number of the dairy of the milk is being produced in countries where feed additives is not the most likely solution. There, to me, it's much more about increasing productivity, increasing milk yield. Again, completely concur with that assessment. Christine, your final thoughts, closing thoughts. Uh, I just want to flag that uh, we are a food company, uh, and uh, so we do see a lot of uh, feed additive solutions uh, coming onto the market. And I just want to flag the need for following these feed additives in, in, in a research setting all the way from the cow to, to the end product that we don't see any contamination. And Sander, closing comments from Cargill's perspective. Thank you, Michael. Well, uh, I would like to emphasize the uh, enormous progress we have, we have made uh, in, in developing feed additives in the scientific community, developing feed additives that are now coming close to market. And I'm really excited about our opportunity to really reduce um, the, the dairy cows emissions. We, we are getting very close to real solutions, I think. Thank you. Um, I will add one, one additional item that I think I skipped over that I think is critically important. And that as we move forward, we continue to address animal health and welfare. I left that off my list when I spoke uh, in my closing comments. I wanted to make sure not to leave that off the list. I wanna thank all the panelists. I wanna thank Danish government and CDFA for their um, participation and their making this seminar happen today. Charles, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Again, uh, I will uh, reiterate what uh, Michael just closed with, but I would like to thank everyone here for attending. I would like to thank our attendees for participating and uh, hanging on with us for the first few minutes of this, uh, this webinar. Um, again, apologies for the technical issues, but I think this was a very productive discussion. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, work with our colleagues from Denmark. Um, and our European colleagues, uh, Sander, Christine, thank you very much, Peter, um, and then folks that we've been working with for, you know, day in and day out, um, Hermias, Michael. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to close this meeting. We This, this webinar was recorded. Uh, we will make sure that we are able to get this recording out on our CDFA YouTube channel and share that with everyone um, who has been in participation today or who registered with that. Thank you all, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your morning or evening in this case. So.